to introduce myself, I'm Jerry Bloomfield from Falcon Acoustics in Oxford, England. Um, and we build the BBC LS35A. Thank you. And the first person I'd like to talk about is a very old friend of mine and colleague. And this is not the BBC side of the story you're seeing here. This is Malcolm Jones, who worked for KEF from 1961 onwards. Uh, I've known him a long, long time. He was the founder of Falcon Acoustics. And he was also the designer of the drive units used by the BBC in the LS35A and LS35. And I call him Squirrel Nutkin a bit because he still has boxfuls of original parts that he made for the BBC back in the 1960s, which we use as reference material. And we, when we started to remanufacture the drive units, which we did a few years ago for people, we had a unique resource because we had access to all of Malcolm's research notes, all of his exercise books, which are carefully marked chemistry, 1955, and he's reusing the same books. And in meticulous detail, he goes through all of the experimental parameters that they did back in 1964 to 66 to make the first B110s and T27s. And that for us, that kind of archive resource, which we have, which is unique, gives a completely different authenticity to the products that we make because we know they're right. And that's Malcolm. He's been, he worked on the KEF side on the LS3535A. And some of the things that you will hear today are not published before because we have access to his notes of the meetings, even to the extent of what he had for lunch at the BBC that day. <laughs> what I want to do, if I can, and I haven't timed this, I hope we're going to make it work, is to try and pull a few strands together to show how the thinking behind the LS35, LS35A started. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the LS35, the first small monitor that the BBC did was called the LS35. As the drive units changed over the years, um, the BBC woke up to the fact they had to change the design slightly. It became the 35A. I'll go into that in more detail. But they, one of the strands that I want to pull through is the Goodman's Maxim. And some of you may have seen these before. We have them on demonstration upstairs. This is a 1964 pair, which I rescued from a skip in Oxford. And the BBC evaluated these instead of perhaps building their own small OB monitor. And they took them apart, played with them, and very sniffily decided that they weren't good enough. <laughs> And the reason for that was that they were concerned about production tolerances, and one of their principal criteria that they were interested in was consistency, because they had to issue these, what the resultant monitors that they were going to do, to studios all over England, and to people like my father, who would take them out in his OB van, and they had to be exactly the same all the time. And there were some serious production consistency issues with the Maxim. And so they rejected it. They're interesting to listen to because they sound totally different to anything the BBC ever produced. This is the BBC report. And this is a typical BBC research and department report, except in one respect that it was published a year rather than two years after the work was done, because it took the BBC a long time to publish reports after the work that they had done. One of the things I would commend to you is some of the work that was done by the BBC R&D department back in the 60s and early 70s. They were probably in the forefront of loudspeaker design technology at the time, both in terms of new materials and in terms of application and getting the designs right. They were a huge resource. Next thing we're going to look at is one of the BBC's own designs, because this is another strand that we're coming into. And this is a monitoring speaker for a one-eighth wavelength acoustic testing for the Maida Vale studio in London. The Maida Vale studio is a very famous studio. It was built by converting some swimming baths. And the acoustics on the initial conversion were widely regarded as poor. And so rather than build an enormous studio and test it, because they couldn't, they did the next best thing, and they built a model. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think the trousers are probably flared, but we're not going to go down that road. <laughs> What's interesting, if I can just point this out, and I know I'm not supposed to walk in front here, is if you look at the two base units here, those are rescued Goodman's Maxim base units. Uh, the tweeter in the middle, which you can't see on this one, but you could see on the previous one, is a T27 designed by Malcolm. And in the top, you can see what looks a bit like a kind of glitter ball and is, in fact, a unidirectional electrostatic tweeter module array. No. <laughs> which went up to, which, and the principle behind this was that it went up to 120 kilohertz, which they could measure. And because it was 1 8th, that was 15 kilohertz in real life. And that was the broadcast maximum high frequency that they were interested in. So it's an, this gives you an idea of the thinking process behind this. It's different. <laughs> the Made of Ale Studio, I have some pictures of them, which I downloaded to bring here, but the resolution isn't very good. But it's identical all the way around still, still in use daily, and used for broadcast and for concerts all the time. And it sounds wonderful. The acoustics are some of the best in the world. <laughs> so again, it gives you an idea of the quality of the work that the BBC was doing at the time, and also Frankly, the sheer tenacity to get it right, because how many other organizations would actually go to the extent of building a model studio to try and get it right? Now I want to talk about the drive units. And these are Falcon drivers. These are our new T27s and B110s, which, as I've already said, are, are exactly like the originals. The BBC and KEF together were in, again, I use the word forefront, in the forefront of new materials technology at the time, stuff that we all take for granted now, was then was quite revolutionary. And the idea of using plastics in loudspeaker cones was, some, was absolutely revolutionary. And we're, talk, we're going back to the sort of mid to late 60s. It simply wasn't done. Most of the people who were involved in the audio industry at the time cut their teeth in Wharfdale under Gilbert Briggs. And he was the granddaddy of British loudspeaker design. He was heavily into paper cones and paper surrounds and fabric surrounds. And some of the young people there obviously wanted to try and change things, which young people do. And they wanted to investigate the use of different materials and whether different cone technologies could actually produce an appreciable benefit. So the, one of the people there was a chap called Raymond Cook, who you may have heard of. And Raymond went off and founded KEF. And KEF stands for Kent Engineering Foundry. And a friend of him, his who actually had a chassis, a metal casting plant, so he, Raymond had a plentiful supply of chassis, made an office available to him. And that's where the name KEF came from. It was down in Maidstone, in Kent, in Toville, by the river. It's still there. <laughs> it still floods. <laughs> what, what was going on here is that the BBC and the KEF almost parallel tracking were looking at plastics and both came up with the idea of using Bextrine for a cone. Bextrine is a polystyrene with rubber admix. And KEF, the BBC tried to make their own drive unit and came down to KEF and said, we can't get it right. They always wanted to make their own drive units. By that time, Malcolm had designed the B110, which was already in production. They said, well, why don't you have these instead? They work. The same of, with the T27. The dome is in Mylar, Melinex, I think you call it over here, Mylar, Melinex, whichever. And that was one of the first ever plastic dome tweeters. Uh, we have drive units that looks as though Malcolm built on his kitchen table, which we're actually using upstairs. So, those are the strands I want to pull together because the three strands of a small outside broadcast monitor, a monitoring facility for testing inside the BBC, and the use of, the, of new materials all came together at the same time to produce the LS3535A. The BBC took the view that if they were going to design their own system, that they would start from scratch. Traditionally, the BBC used plywood as a cabinet me method of construction. This is in nine ply, thin wall nine ply. And this is probably, must be serious, certainly amongst the first cabinets that they produced. This one's owned by Terry Miles from Spender Audio. 
And he was given it by Spencer Hughes, who was working at the BBC and founded Spendor Audio, as you probably all know. It's an interesting animal. This is an original T27 from the period. Terry's had problems with the base unit in the bottom, and he's had to replace it with a later one. And what's interesting to us, because the BBC is clearly working on variations on a theme here, is that for the first time ever, and as you know, the LS3, 5A and 3.5 is a sealed box, there's a port. <laughs> Now, there's only been one picture of this published up to now online, and Terry very kindly made half a day available to me. Um, and we'll just have a look at some of the other pictures of it. This is the crossover in the back of it. <laughs> and as you can see, it's quite interesting. There was, a, there was a conspiracy theory amongst people who've actually seen this that the reason that the paper tape is there is to stop you looking at what's actually there. It's supposed to be a deficiency. secret. In actual fact, it's just holding the banks of capacitors in place. I don't want you to think there's any great mystique to this speaker, despite the, the iconic status it has. There's a lot of practical accidents as it evolves. And you can see there, very basic construction technique. This one was, this one was, was uh, Spencer's own one. So it's quite likely that he did all the work on this as part of the experimental program. The BBC inductors are interesting. Um, these days, uh, we tend to wind inductors either on ferrites or on iron cores, as you know. It's not, an, it's not usual to use laminations these days. We still use them because it's what the specification calls for. And if you look in the gaps there, and if I just point it here, just there, can you see the gaps? And there's machine screws here clamping it all together. It's po what happens when you put a, an inductor like that onto a PCB and clamp it down is that the, the gaps close and the value alters very slightly. And what you can do with the machine screws is to fine tune it back to where it was. So the BBC have produced a transformer that you can actually fine tune and adjust the value of in situ to get it back to the nominal value. It's like my Triumph sports car. It's exactly like your Triumph sports car. And I used to sit on the front wheel of mine and fix it as well. Now, we've remanufactured we've re these. Uh, we've had the lambs made, and we've got a local engineering company to actually make the clamps again for us. And they may be old-fashioned, but my goodness, they work. They work better than anything that's made these days. We can't buy off the shelf to get the accuracy that we can get with these things. This is the back view. You can see the back of the original T27. We're probably in 1966 at the moment, is my guess, in terms of dating it. Foam in the back there, because it's an LS35A, but underneath, you'll see there's no damping, there's no gaskets. This is a classic BBC thin wall cabinet. Kef, in the meantime, have produced their own variant on this, called the Kef Cresta, 1968. Original B110 and a later version of the T27, because this is the second version of the T27. The units are interchangeable but you start to see a shape of a, a cabinet emerging and you can see the start of a philosophy of approach beginning to emerge here. This was available commercially and it's sold in thousands in the UK. I don't know if it ever made it over to the States, but I've got a pair of these. Um, actually, they don't sound bad at all, quite honestly. Sure. Were they used in any of the recording studios at that time? No, uh, what Kef did was to offer them to the BBC and the BBC said, no, we, we, we prefer our own. <laughs> At this time, the LS35 was actually made. The BBC had made 20 LS35s, similar to the cabinets that I've shown you before, with the older KEF drive units in. The cost then was £100,000 for the 20 that they made. That's the equivalent of two and a quarter million dollars in 2018 money over here, which is quite a lot of money. Uh, public sector organization. The, R the research and development department was in a very nice Georgian villa set in a country estate 20 miles away from the rest of the BBC. And I'm not, I, I would take some convincing that there was much communication going on between the two. They had a very good life down there, I reckon. So this was, the, this was something that Kef was producing at the same time. The LS35 looked like this. This is one that we have upstairs. It's a nine millimeter plywood cabinet. You'll notice that the base unit is set behind the baffle, which was the classic BBC way of doing things. If you ever see an LS35A and it's got it on the front, it's not an LS35A. It's as simple as that. That's the 
old version of the T27, which is in a Bakelite molding. And the reason it was discontinued was the tooling wore out. And KEF made a loss on each and every single one that they made. So when they came to revise it, when Markham came to revise it, they changed the way of producing it. But this is probably the first time, and if you have, any of you haven't heard them upstairs, do go and listen to them. It's the first time that you will have been able to hear the original version of the LS35 and how it was meant to work. Not much damping inside. Thin plywood cabinet, a lossy cabinet because it's not fixed with gaskets. And what we've heard upstairs is very intriguing to us because it sounds so much like a production LS35A that we make now. You can hear the continuity of the voice coming through over 50 years. In, so we are now in 1972. The, these were made about 1970. The BBC didn't do very much with them. And in 1972, they decided they were going to put them into production. Now, the history books of the LS35A said this all happened in 1974. And it didn't. It was 1972, and we know that because Malcolm took notes of the meeting, and he measured these <laughs> at the same time. So we, we've shaved two years off the history of this. What's intriguing to me is that they didn't know that the drive units had changed at the time. Nobody had bothered to tell the BBC. There hadn't been any interaction between the two organizations. And the fact they wanted to put them into production now caused a problem. The crossover is different in this from the LS35A because of the different drive units. In 1974, the BBC woke up to the fact that they had these units and they invited commercial companies to start to manufacture them. They went down to KEF and they said, here's our, th here's our thing, can we have the drive units again, please? And Malcolm says, no, we don't make them anymore. We've got these. And KEF said, well, would you make, a BBC rather said, would you make them for us, please? And KEF said, no, not unless you want to pay for the old tooling to be replaced, which would be at a cost of X, whatever it was, 10,000 pounds or whatever it would be at the time. And the BBC, not unreasonably, said, I think we've spent enough on this. Maybe we should just see what we can do with the new drive units. So you can see the beginnings of a large bureaucracy with different departments not talking to each other. This is the back of some cabinets that we've got in our own collection, which we use as reference material. This is an LS35 cabinet being reworked for the LS35A. They were experimenting with different forms of damping to see what they could do. And classically, the BBC would use them on wall mounts, which is why we think we've got the metal plate there, because there's no other good reason for it. But you can see again, thin wall cabinet, and all of the cabinets, and we, and we looked hard at the one that Terry has got from, in Spendor, and they're all from the same batch of plywood, so we know they're reusing the LS35 cabinets to make the LS35A. LS35A number three. You can't get much earlier than that other than one and two. We know where they are. Um, typical XLR connector because BBC Studio use. Uh, it's, just, it's just from our point of view as, as loud speaker uh, sort of archive. It's, it's interesting material to us. That's the inside of one. This is, a num this is, a, this is number four. You can see, and we, we think we know whose handwriting it is, and the, the batons inside, as you know, are famously beech on the LS35A. In the LS35, they were pine, piranha pine. And somebody's written in here, this must be beech. <laughs> so you can see the evolution of the design taking place in front of you now. It's coming together. We thought it would be interesting to show you that there is no damping inside it still. <laughs> and it's still a nine millimeter cabinet. This is the classic BBC thin wall cabinet. Uh, in terms of an information resource and for authenticity, it's second to none. You can't get better than this. The changeover to the LS35A was done, undertaken by the BBC design department in London rather than the R&D department 20 miles away on their country estate. I think probably, we don't know for sure, but we think probably because time was of the essence now and they needed to get people up to speed, having taken the decision that these should be manufactured commercially under license. You won't have ever seen this before. This is the first one, that, the first time it's ever been seen in public. Um, but this is the frequency response curve of the BBC LS35 that came down in 1972 to KEF, and Malcolm took the measurements of it and this is 
probably the only trace that there's ever been and, and still exists of the original BBC LS35. And you can see the date, 18th in English, in, on, the, on the British way, 18th of April, 1972. So we're able to date this. You see, it's not the smoothest operator in the world. <laughs> not much else to say, really. The, from our point of view, the, 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 the T27 is doing something a bit strange here in, when they, they've done the response curve. That shouldn't be there. Impedance curve, classic LS35, 305A impedance curve. But as I say, that is probably the only one, the only record that actually exists of the LS35 because we don't believe they actually physically exist any longer. This is a classic example of departments not talking to each other. This is the Rogers publicity material from 1974 because Rogers were going to be one of the licensees for the LS35. They've got it all printed up. They're, everybody's going hard at it. Sales department in the BBC and the licensing department said, we've got, we've got this product. The only difficulty, the only difficulty is that nobody's told them they can't have it. <laughs> um, if I had been Rogers at the time, I'd have been a little bit cross, <laughs> to put it into British ease. And Rogers got round it in the classic British fashion. They stuck a label on the bottom saying it's been improved and it's now turned into the LS35A instead of reprinting them all. But that gives you an idea of what commercially was likely to happen. Uh, the fact that they've taken the photograph upside down and the woofer and the tweeters shows attention to detail. <laughs> um, <laughs> We, we've learned to live with these things in our business. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, they've got a, uh, they've actually got an LS35A uh, crossover there rather than an LS35 crossover. So somebody somewhere has got, there's a, there's a degree of confusion creeping right the way through all of this. And I should imagine there's probably a few rude words being said within the BBC between the various departments at the same time. Uh, I mean, the BBC is an enormous organisation still. It's much more centralised than it used to be, but it's still pretty much spread over bits of London. So the communications will be getting a little bit difficult. More, more on the previous cabinets, just to show you the handwriting. We've duplicated a slide there. We've done that. Um, what is interesting also about these, which I've mentioned, is that the LS35A is different from the LS35 in that the cabinet is more damped the B110 is actually sealed to the back of the baffle board at the front. Do you call them baffle boards? Um, by means of a channel strip. And the, as I said before, the, the uh, battens in there, the, do you call them battens here? These, these, the support struts, anyway, are in beech rather than piranha pine. The important thing is the quality of the construction, again, because the BBC cabinets were made to a very high standard. Um, this is an original BBC LS35A crossover. This is one of the experimental ones. You can see the same transformer styles being used. You can see the, what looks, starts to emerge now as a sort of classic BBC LS35A crossover. Uh, they've realized they've got problems with the rising response due to inductance on the tweeter coil, and they've put the Zobel components in at the bottom. This board doesn't actually have it because this is a BBC produced board. And so they've drilled holes in it and they've done a manual mount for the, the Zobel that we all, we all know and love now. But it, it's getting there. You can see the pins for the taps there coming through. Um, nobody in their right mind does it this way these days, but that's the way it was done then. That's the way we do it now. So that's a classic BBC uh, LS35A1. That's a Kingswood Warren one. We've got a pair of them in various stages of decay. Upstairs, we've got a... BBC Thinwall LS35A, 9.5 mil, first time it's ever been built in public. You can hear them upstairs if you haven't already done so. We've spent the best part of £2,000 on getting new polycarbonate capacitors made. You can't get the film now. We found some. And this is what the BBC would have produced in the design department. It's interesting to listen to. The mid-range is very nice because it's a lossy cabinet because there's no gaskets on it or anything like that. Uh, the base is slightly less, less evident than it is on the production version that we have up there. But you can hear what the BBC were actually trying to do with it. They were, the, the, the voicing is very similar. This is our constant reference document. This is the BBC report, 1976. Notice it took them two years to produce it. And this is our reference point for everything that we do. This is the specification that Falcon builds to. 
We're the only people in the world who do, because we're the only people who can produce the correct drive units. And we refer to this constantly, and we can use reference material from this. Remember that the LS35A is designed to sound the same year on year, manufacturer to manufacturer, studio to studio. You get issued with three, if you were my father going out on OB work, and he would pick up two and a spare in case one broke, and he would be able to interchange any of those, any make, and they would all sound the same. That was the principle behind it. BBC needed consistency all the time. This is uh, Roger's production 15 ohm LS35A. We've got them upstairs. Uh, you'll notice that it's gone to a 12 mil cabinet, but it's the classic Rogers LS35A that probably lots of you have owned over the years. Uh, they're going strong. This one's got, a, this particular pair, which are mine, have got a bit of a peak at 1K because the base unit has started to get a little bit old. But you'll notice the Tigon grill. They have to be played with Tigon grills. Uh, other than that, this is a pretty classic LS35A, and they stayed in production until the mid-80s. Various makes, which I'll show you later, but these are the things that you see on eBay all the time. If, by the way, uh, you see one with a BBC logo on it, it's a fake. We'll come to that in a minute. This is a Falcon LS35A crossover. We've got one here if you want to have a look afterwards. And you'll see it's exactly the same as the BBC one. The topography has changed slightly, but the component values are all the same, and they're round to the same specification values. What we do uh, is, as uh, some of you will know from the demonstration upstairs, we actually measure our inductors to pair match the three decimal places because we want to get them exactly matched as far as we can all the way through. And components are similarly matched. The drive units that we make are matched to half a dB for production all the way through. And the level of consistency you get comparing that against the reference version, you can imagine that they're a very consistent product that are coming out now. 1987, problems with Beckstreen. Beckstreen was used to make the cones by KEF. It the was then used in the car industry as panel damping. And KEF got what was left after the main, main purchasers had got their stuff. And they were getting huge inconsistency problems with both Beckstreen and with the neoprene surrounds. They remodeled the B110. And in, instead of it being an 8 ohm unit, it became a 6 ohm unit, and the LS35A went to 11 ohms. A lot of people liked the 11 ohm. I happen to like the 15 ohm version. But again, we've got the 11 ohm version upstairs for you to listen to. And that stayed in production until 2004. This is a class, this is shows, this is a, an 11 ohm version. You'll see there's a slight difference in the drive unit. It's got what we call a progressive surround, a PVC surround. It's not got a, a symmetrical roll, it's progressive, and it's a heavily plasticized PVC. That brings its own problems for KEF owners because the plasticizer migrates out of the PVC into the glue that it's stuck on and you get a yellow ring around it. The difficulty you have is that you cannot predict how the plasticizer is going to come out, so you get different plasticized sections of the surround operating, which means that generally speaking, after about 15 years, these units are beginning not to be consistent. And I keep using the word consistent because that's what it's all about as far as the monitoring side is concerned. This is a Rogers uh, 11 ohm crossover. Um, it's a production one. It's not the neatest thing in the world. Uh, iron dust inductors. And as you can see, it's just, it, it doesn't look quite right. Here's another one from the same period. And, and this is where it, it, it's, it's not right. <laughs> you know, you, it's, it's not going to be something that you would really want to manufacture if you're getting that level of inconsistency of approach coming through. So what KEF did is they said, we will produce the drive units in matched sets to manufacturers and we will produce the crossover for that match set at the same time. So this is a, a, this is a KEF 11 ohm crossover from the period, and you can see it's a much better looking product altogether. And if it looks right, it probably is right. It's, it's a good maxim. It looks like sushi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go for colors. We go for colors. Right. These are the manufacturers that have done them over the years. Some of them you will have heard of, some of them you won't. You'll notice that Falcon isn't on there. The ones in green are the people who made the 15 ohm. 
Uh, the ones in red are people that made the 11 ohm version. Uh, Spendor also made the 11 ohm version. We made the crossovers for the Goodmans, and we made the crossover, that's a weird Falcon, and we also made them for the RAM as well. We also helped build the RAM ones when RAM went bust, and Malcolm had to get some of his money back somehow, so he went away and built up LS35As for RAM. So that's not Roger McGuess. That's not what, sorry? That's not Roger McGuess. No, 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 these are earlier ones. These are, these are Vince Jennings RAMs. <laughs> Uh, Richard Allen, we're not sure about. We never, nobody's quite sure whether any, he actually, they actually produced any or not. There was one pair that appeared on eBay not so long ago, which everybody fought over. I'm not sure they were real, um, but I'm prepared to be proved wrong, happily. Okay? In terms of numbers, there's a dispute over the numbers of LS35As that were actually made, but if you said somewhere between 60 and 100,000, you wouldn't be far out in terms of pairs altogether. My own feeling is it's probably somewhere in the middle, around about 80,000. 2015, we start producing the 15 ohm to the absolute specification of the BBC, even to the extent of weighing the plywood panels to come in that they, that they to make sure they're of the right density. It's been a huge success, and, and we're very proud of it. It's the only one, as I said before, that actually accords fully to the BBC specification that's now made. And uh, I think everybody's very pleased with it, frankly. The BBC certainly seemed to like it anyway. And there it is. You can see these pair, this pair upstairs in uh, 557. One of the nice things about them that we can do is that we can play with the veneers because it's a small cabinet and we can have fun with some nice classic veneers instead of, instead of all the usual ones that you see everywhere. We can have things like burr walnut. We've done some in 350-year-old rosewood from France for one of our distributors. We're just doing another one in Amboina Burr. Um, we can use exotic timbers. Because it's a small cabinet, we can get away with it. And it's fun. It's fun. Clones and facsimiles. You'll see huge numbers of copies of the LS35A all over the place. Um, the first thing I'm going to say, as I said before, is if it's got a BBC logo on the back, it's a fake. Uh, if it hasn't, there's, there's a growing feeling now that if it hasn't got a B110 and a T27 in it, and you'll see them coming with CS drive units, all sorts of drive units from Taiwan, everywhere all over the place. Um, the, the feeling now is that, it's probably, that if they haven't got the correct drive unit in, it's not an LS35A, except, except you can put it on the label. Um, I've seen some wonderful fakes over the years. Um, it's quite flattering, really. <laughs> I can't think, but they never sound quite right. This is what goes inside a Falcon Acoustics LS35A. You can see that there's an awful lot of bits in it. Everything is done by hand. They take about a week and a half in total to make with all the processes if you aggregated it together. They're very much a labor of love. Um, they are exactly as they should be. We've, the only thing that we have changed, there are two things in fact, one is that we've changed to our own brass nickel-plated terminal on the back because the plastic ones break. And the second thing is that on the B110 chassis, we put in a small upstand for a proper terminal lug as opposed to the little zinc terminals that KEF used to use, which keep on breaking. Other than that, it's exactly as it would have been years ago, all those years ago. Oh, myths. Thin wall cabinet. Does the thin, lots of people will say, does the thin wall cabinet sound better than the 12 mil cabinet. It sounds different, is the nicest way of putting it. We've just started working on our thin, the thin wall version upstairs. You can hear it for the first time. What's interesting to me is that the mid-range is, is very clear indeed. Because it's, it is a lossy, much more lossy cabinet, uh, the base response is not the same as on a, on a 12 mil cabinet. And I think it's really what you're going, I, I think you're going to end up saying, which do I prefer? Um, whether we will put it into production, I don't know. We're thinking about it at the moment. The white belly B110. The famous white belly B110. People all over the world say that your B110 is not going to be a proper functioning LS35A and B110 unless it's got a white belly. This is the white belly off of Rogers. Now, <sighs> that's the response curve of a white belly B110, which would drive me to distraction. And you can see the socking rate peak at about 1K, something like that. And that's caused by the white belly. And the white belly is where the Plastiflex dope that's put onto the front of the cone has separated away and left a cavity, in it, a cavity underneath for resonance. <laughs> it's not functioning properly. 
It's not what it's meant to do. Yeah, it's scar tissue. It's a good. It's a good way of putting it. And that junction there between the dust cap and the cone is actually a critical functioning area for the unit. And as soon as it breaks down like that, it goes off response, and you can see the effect of it just there on that where you've got that peak. Can that be fixed? Uh, only if you take the whole of it off and try and read. The whole thing has actually got to be a unified bond right the way across the dust cap up to the first part of the roll of the surround. Very difficult. The green tint B110. Lots of people say, particularly the, the Chartwell owners, bless them, that if the B110 has a green tint on the cone, it's going to sound better than one that doesn't. And if I told you that the green tint tells me that the B110 has been affected by damp, you'll understand that I take a certain degree of, I, I sort of look at this a bit harder. The green tint comes solely from the fact that the Plastiflex cone, dope on the front of the cone, has been affected by humidity and damp. And it's not performing in the same way as it was. To show you how ridiculous it can get in the, in the LS35A world, there are arguments going on whether the silver, the silver badge makes a difference compared to the gold badge on the front of the speaker. And at that point, I kind of bow out of the conversation. <laughs> you know, just, you just sort of, you, you think, why? <laughs> So coming down, you, what you can see, and you'll see them on, for those of you who haven't been upstairs, we've got the entire development of the LS3535A on display upstairs. You can compare and contrast all of the models. You're very welcome to come up and talk to us. We're up there, and that's what you will see. And that really is the best I can offer you today. So any, any more questions? So. The uh, three transformers in the crossover, uh, how are they used? How, how do you mean how are they used? Are they used for uh, sensitivity matching? How are they used? The only one that's used for sensitivity matching, L1, the first one, is actually used to, uh, that section is correcting in that, and revising the axial response on the B110. L2 corrects a hump. The one that affects sensitivity of just the tweeter is L3, the third one with the taps on it. And that each tap gives you basically a 1 dB difference attenuation uh, on, the, on the system. I know you wanted to put microphones in. Could you tell uh, folks where uh, one can purchase the product line in the United States? Uh, I can now, yes. If you go and talk to Mophie Distribution, they are handling it in the United States. The BBC had these as wall-mounted units mostly, but we would play them on stands. Yep. Could you comment on either the height or types of stands that would be most appropriate? About to, about 20, if you're playing on stands, around about 24 inches high, try to get the tweeter to ear height as you would do with any other speaker. Make sure that they're coupled to the stand with a bit of blue tack or something like that. Um, bear in mind the BBC used them in a multiplicity of, of applications. You can see them in freestanding, sitting on top of studio mixing desks. You can see them stuffed into metal racks in the backs of vans. You can see them hanging off the ceiling in television outside broadcast vans. They were designed to be interchangeable all the way through. There, there, wasn't, any, there wasn't any sort of fixed location requirement on them at all. So I uh, patronized a dealer that would demonstrate them tip back. In fact, they built stands with tip them back about 25 degrees. The idea was to align the voice coils. <coughs> yep. Next. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, not, I just think that's silly. <laughs> I think I'm right here. Uh, power requirements and preferred types of amplification. You can use the LS35. Remember, they're 15 ohm impedance, um, but you can use the, the LS35A if you're using Class A or tubes. Uh, 25 watts is fine. 20 watts in tubes is good. Uh, if you're using anything else, say 35 to 50 watts, to give yourself give yourself a bit of headroom with an 8 ohm output, you'll be absolutely fine. They're a very easy drive. They've got a, they're, they're, they're not demanding to drive at all. I mean, we've seen them working very well with four watt output tube amps, and they sing. <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're not sense, they're, they're not fussy in that way at all. A super specific question and a very, very naive one. Uh, how long are these BBC reports that specify? How many pages long are they? I'll count them for you. <laughs> um, let's have a look for one. Where is it? I think I bought one here today. 
Hang on that, I'll tell you. Where is it? Here it is, pass it around. <laughs> Thank know. you. And you can count the page, it saves me bank counting. Let's make sure I get it back. Sounds silly in such a very specific uh, uh, <sighs> setting, but what does LS3 and 5A okay. stand for? Right. Thank you. Right. LS means obviously loudspeaker. A 3 means it's for outside broadcast use. The slash 5 means it's number 5 in the model range that the BBC developed, and the A is a version 2. <laughs> it was as simple as that. So whatever became of the LS 1 and 2, and it, was there ever a 4? There was an LS4. Um, I, haven't, I haven't majored out on the earlier models. I must confess, I've concentrated on this one. There's enough complexity with this one. But you'll, you'll see them coming up. You, you'll see, you, the designs are available still online, and you can, you can find them sometimes coming up. Mostly they, mostly they seem to emanate from ex-BBC engineers who have lovingly rescued them as they walked out of the door or something like that. Well, at risk of embarrassing myself, I have, um, I have the late 70s <coughs> version, and I had some trouble with it sounding the way I wanted it to. And I, I put the four sorbethane feet on the bottom of it. Yep. And that seemed to help. Yep. Does that make any sense to you? A little, but I think it's probably going to be more subjective than anything else. But if if they work better for you that way, that was probably more a question to do with your room acoustics isn't than anything else. But they wouldn't, they're, because they're a sealed cabinet, and then they're, they're not fussy the way they're handled. Um, I would think that's probably more to do with the dynamics of your listening area than anything else. Possibly the resonance of the thing that it's yeah, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't think, it wouldn't be the cabinet. Uh, because of the lossy construction of the unit, um, you mentioned stands of 24 inches. Mm -hmm. Would the stand being a little bit lossy be an advantage over a, a, a very dense stand? You have, to, you have to be very careful on the stands you use. I mean, we, we developed a stand for the, for the use with the LS358. It took a long time to get the tuning right. Um, the ones that we've got are 16 kilos each. They're filled roughly two thirds, something like that. They're a steel stand. Um, you don't, but I would, yeah, I would counsel a little bit of caution with stands purely because if you, they, the ones we got actually are almost like tuned to the LS three five A. If you were using a really massive stand, I think you'd probably kill anything that, that kill the bass off quite a bit. I'm at your disposal. You can ask away what you like. And go for this it. This is uh, not anything to do with the speakers per se, but the picture that you showed of the miniature, uh, if you like, amphitheater. Oh yes. And there was a spherical device with lots of holes in it. Yep. Could you talk about what that was? I think I can, yes, because I asked Malcolm about it, anticipating your question, because he actually helped the BBC choose the tweeters to go on the top of that. We, we think it was something like, in, in, in the UK, we, have, we, we think it's a plastic bowl with polyfiller on top of it. And each of, those, each of those little circular things is actually an electrostatic tweeter module, about two inches in diameter. Yeah, I think it's exactly that. We think it's a we think it's a it's a, it's a unidirectional electrostatic tweeter assembly, so they can actually see what the, the overall dispersion is likely to be of the room, and it's going to have all the saddles and everything behind it. I said to Malcolm, "Did you ever see it in action?" He said, "No, I just helped them find the tweeters. We imported them from America because it's not the sort of thing that we made in the UK." But it looks to us, I mean, I said to him, I don't know if you, any of you have ever been to England, but we have pedestrian crossings there with, with uh, big orange spheres on the top in two halves. And it looks to me like somebody went out and took the top of the half off, covered it in polyfill and stuck bits on all over it. It's got that kind of feel to it to me. I mean, I'm probably doing everybody a disservice, but the honest answer is we don't know now, but that's the kind of feel it has. You have all the drivers for sale? Yes, they're on our website. My woofers are fried, the tweeters work. Mm -hmm. Should I replace the tweeters too? No, if the tweeters are working, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The gentleman over there has been, I'll get you, I'll get you next. Do you supply the um, AB uh, base units? The, they have a little pedestal, like uh, AB one for subwoofer that they use? The, ups, the subwoofer. Um, we, we looked at it for a while, and it's not, a particularly popular thing. I mean, there is a commercial decision here that we have to make as well. Um, 
Also, it's personal. I don't actually like it very much, okay. is the honest truth. I like to listen to my LS35A as it was meant to be, without something going poop, poop, poop in the bottom end. And I, it's, it's just a personal thing. It's not my favorite piece of, of addition to the LS35A farm, if you know what I mean. You had a question. Yeah, the crossovers. Sure. Are all the capacitors film? I mean, what I'm really getting to is what is sort of the deterioration or lifetime of the crossovers? The, 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 the capacitors that are used now are all film. Um, they've certainly got a 25-year life in them. Some of the earlier ones, you'll find that the film capacitors now have started to degrade quite a bit. Um, if they were polycarbonate capacitors that were fitted originally, and some of the chart wheels we believe have polycarbonate capacitors in, then they are absolutely stable. They're not going to shift in the month of Sundays. But some of the earlier ones that were made, undoubtedly they're moving, and you, you can, you, we've, we've measured them, and they're, they're way out, throwing, throwing the crossover around. But realistically, you should be thinking in terms of at least a 25-year lifespan on the capacitors. And even then, I doubt very much you're going to have much of a stability issue, certainly with modern ones. Did you ever uh, try the uh, Satterberg aftermarket subwoofer? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had enough. I had enough. I had no. I, know, I had enough to do getting this. Quite honestly. <laughs> no. Okay. Anybody else? What was your involvement in the process or project? In the project? Yeah. Which, which one? Uh, the whole thing. Yeah. Oh well, I, I took I took over Falcon Acoustics from Malcolm ten years ago, um, and he and I went out one evening and we went out for a curry, and we probably had a little bit of wine too much, um, and got carried away. And we decided it would be a good idea to start to remanufacture the drive units. It was something he'd always wanted to do. And we started with the B110, which took two and a half years to get right, because it's, it's, it's much easier to make a modern drive unit than it is to actually find the materials and make an older drive unit correctly again. It's not reverse engineering, it's re-engineering, it's whatever phrase you want to use. It took me two years to actually get the Beckstrine, somebody to actually make a ton of Beckstrine. Um, the good thing that we found was that the Beckstrine that we had made, which was done by CNC, is unconditionally the same right the way through all the 20 rolls that we've got. Now, that's more than enough to last my life, then they're probably going to bury me in a Beckstrine coffin, I should think. <laughs> but it, it, does, it, it, it will last us a long, long time. So I, we then did the T27 together, and Back in 1984, Falcon approached the BBC for an LS35A license. And this was when, I think it was probably Chartwell went, went bust at the time, the, the, the original Chartwell. And Falcon was turned down by the BBC because they said that the cross, crossovers that were submitted were too accurate and close to the specification to be, be production crossovers. And that really niggled Markham. He was cross. He's been cross ever since. And he was even crosser because he was actually making those for Goodman's at the time. And all he'd done is take two production ones for Goodman's and take them up to the BBC and say, look what we can do. So we manufactured the drive units again. We've always been a resource for LS35A spares. And I said to him, uh, around, I, think, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I said, let's go to the BBC with our bits and see if we can get an LS35A license. And we're... So, you know, we're talking sort of around about, I think, about 2013, something like that. And we went trotting off to the BBC, and I, I remember uh, being in a slight state of panic because I hadn't prepared for, the, for that, rather than the same way as I hadn't prepared for this. And I had a, a wickerwork picnic basket held together with green binder twine, twine, and we went up to the BBC Research and Development Department in this incredibly expensive-looking glass laboratory, undid our binder twine, and put the stuff out on this meeting desk. And people came in and they said, what have you got? And I showed them what we got, which was a crossover and a couple of drive units. And I said, we can make the cabinets. And that's the back view of what we took up. And they came in and they said, are you going to make this again? Oh, we'd love to. Oh, right. How did you make this? How did you make that? And we had about 40 minutes of people asking us questions. And I remember saying, we came up to talk about the license. They said, oh, you've got that. How did you make this? How did you do that? <laughs> And we said to them, um, you know, what would you like from us? And they said, oh, you probably know far more about it than we do. 
it was very gratifying. And we took them up the finished product, and they just fell over. And that's how we started making it again. I come from a family, my father was a BBC man, my sister's from the BBC, my brother-in-law is BBC. I, in my youth, worked at the BBC. So it was like a sort of natural family for me. And I remember we went down and we said, well, that went all right, didn't it? And uh, we celebrated with a piece of lemon drizzle cake and a cup of tea in the canteen. <laughs> And Malcolm at that point felt slightly vindicated. All, the, all those years of niggling had, had evaporated at that point. <laughs> any more questions or should we click? Yes, happy to, happy to take anything you want to ask. It's not a problem. We've got five minutes left apparently. So do you play them grills on or grills off? On, always. Absolutely. If you're playing your LS358s with the grills off, it is not what was intended. This speaker is almost unique. It's designed to be played with a Tigan grill on. Okay. Why? Why? It's because it actually forms a. It actually affects the response curve because of the weight of the material, and you, as you can see, you've got a felt, a, a quadrilateral felt, this rectangular felt um, anti diffraction uh, section going around the T27 and it binds onto that and seals, and it's one way of dealing with some of the diffraction of the T27 as well. It's integral to the response curve, as is the weight of the Tigan. You can have Tigan, you can't get Tigan very easily these days. We have it specially made. Sadly, a friend of mine who used to make it up in Yorkshire in a small mill from the 17th century has died, so we get it remade now somewhere else. But the weight has got, the weight of the Tigan, the actual fiber that's used is critical to the response curve. It's got to be absolutely right. And again, you will see cl clones and fakes. They're using sort of stuff made in various other countries, and it's all wrong. It, it, the response curves are wrong. It is a critical component. All of the, this unit is a blend of critically selected components. You can't make it just picking one bit here and there and hope it will be all right. That's not how it works. Any more? No? Well, I'll, I'll finish at that point then, if I may. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.